everyone, my name is Chloe and today I'm here to do my um, July mid-month wrap up. So it is already the middle of July. I know everybody says it and all of that, but like summer is flying by. For at least those of us in the Midwest, our kids get out of school at the end into middle of May and then they start back up like right at the beginning of August and for me it doesn't impact me that much because my kids aren't in school yet that kind of stuff but my babysitter is and she was a senior in high school this last year so she is moving and so we are about to be without a babysitter which is fine it's just really helpful like as I get closer to the end of pregnancy to not have to take the girls to all my appointments and that kind of stuff so I am like stressing a little bit about losing our sweet babysitter and the end of summer, even though I don't have school age kids. So um, in the first half of July, I read 13 books, which feels really good like that. I'm really proud of that. Um, I read 3,869 3, pages, which is about 258 pages a day. The average length of each of the books was 298 pages, and that's a stat I might start leaving out because I have a couple middle grade books that I read with my daughter mixed in, and those are like 100 pages-ish, and so that really like messes up my average, so I may just like get rid of that stat, but I read eight novels, three chapter books, and two graphic novels. Um, eight of those were adult, one was young adult, and four were middle grade, and then as far as the star rating goes, I had an awesome first half of July. So one two star, one three star, um, six four stars, one four and a half, and four five stars. Four or five stars never happens for me, but the exception is middle grade and graphic novels and memoirs. I often rate higher than I do other books um, just because like I just feel like I can't find anything wrong with them and they're they're really great. So and I read some like definitely favorite ones this month. So um, the average was 4.12, which is higher than it's been, I think, all year. I read eight off my shelf and five that I did not own on my shelf, um, which, again, feels pretty good. Like, I'm trying to read, I, I would say, like, I don't have a hard and fast goal right now, but I would say my goal generally is to read more off my shelf than not, but I'm not, like, solely focusing on that like I did last year. So um, I read five from Libby, three from the library, two just directly off my shelf, one from NetGalley, one from Hoopla, and one from Kindle Unlimited. So I also feel pretty good about that because I utilize like all the resources I have because I don't have Scribd or anything like, or I don't have Audible, um, Libro FM. I didn't listen to any, so I should I should have done that. But otherwise, Libby, Library, my shelf, NetGalley, Hoopla, and Kindle Unlimited. I feel like I'm killing that. So um, five of the like five of the books I read, I read on audio. Five I read physically. Two I read as an ebook, and one I read as an e arc. So um, the e arcs, sometimes I have them both like ebook and audiobook, and so I'll switch back and forth, or it's one or the other. I just have not like separated those out. Um, I read one new release and 12 backlist, which that's the most like skewed this has ever been for me. So that's interesting that like my highest ratings. Is the, is the time when I have like the most backlist. So maybe this is a lesson to myself. Like you don't always have to just keep up with the new stuff because maybe that's not my favorite. So I don't know. Um, I, as far as genres go, I read three mystery thrillers, three women's fiction, two romance, two nonfiction, two contemporary, and one magical realism. So that is all the stats for, for this first half of the month. Let's just get into the books. So the first book I read was The Dinner Guest by Kirsten, Mo Kirsten Moglin. I don't know why her name like trips me up so much, but I gave this one four stars. This is her newest release, and the only other book I've read by her I really did not like. So I was really nervous going into this book. If you have not heard of her, she writes really short thrillers um, that I would say are... Well, I can't, I, I've only read two. I can't say like what they are in general, but I know that they are all short thrillers. And sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't, but like short thrillers in general. This one did. So this one for me was about, well, this was about like a neighborhood. I kind of pictured a cul-de-sac. I live on a cul-de-sac, so maybe that's why, but I pictured a neighborhood and there's a house where new people are moving in. And these new people are really mysterious. Like they're, and they're having all this security put up on their house. Like who are these people? Are they famous? Like what are they so like, worried about protecting. I don't know. And then all of the neighbors get like a note on their door inviting them to basically a dinner party, 
at the new people's house. And so most of them are super curious about like, who are these people? So they go. Everybody else on the cul-de-sac, I'm going to call it, I don't, I don't think it ever says, I think it's actually just a street, but everybody else like went to high school together and knows each other really well. So they kind of all decide to go to this dinner party together. Well, come to find out it is like an escape room slash like murder dinner theater kind of thing. And we don't know what's going on. We don't know who's really behind it. Um, presumably it's the people that live there because they disappear, but it is, it is a really fun time. We get to find out a lot more about all the people that live in the neighborhood and like what happened in high school and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. So four stars on that one. Next is When Stars Are Scattered by Victoria Jameson and Omar Muhammad. So Victoria Jameson is a pretty prolific um, middle grade graphic novel illustrator. And this is a, I, I would say middle grade, but it really has like no age limit, but it is a memoir of Omar Muhammad's story as he was living for many, many, many years in a refugee camp um, after his home in Somalia had been destroyed. And he, it's he, him and his little brother, and he takes care of his little brother. His little brother has special needs. And he, their mother did not, was not able to come. We don't know if she lived or died for a lot of the story. And it is so good. It is so good. Like this book is hard um, just because it's heartbreaking. Like this little boy gets the opportunity to go to school and he's so torn between what to do because I mean, he feels this strong sense of responsibility for his brother because his brother really struggles without him and they are all they have. They do have like a kind of foster mom who lives in a tent next to them that kind of looks after them, but she's super old and um, just can't do a whole lot. And so he feels a lot of responsibility for his brother. He also wonders like what would his parents have wanted him to do and what can he do? And then just the like tease of being taken out of the refugee camp and family families that get chosen to go to either America or Canada and like how he, how that happens and how just different dynamics among the group of friends, of kids, of all of these people as they are trying to get to a better situation because where they are now, they're in a refugee camp. So they're safe, I guess, but they're, they're not living in great conditions and they just need the opportunity for a better life. And it was heartbreaking. It really made me want to like do something to help this cause because there's so much still going on in the world and we are so privileged, but, um, it was just so good. It was so good. And it was like, the artwork was great. Like I said, Victoria Jameson, she does a really great job. This was so good. It was something I read in the matter of a couple hours. I just like did not want to put it down because at the end you get real life photos and like kind of what happened to Omar and his brother. And it was, it was so good. So five stars on that one. Next is Karen's Worst Day um, by Ann M. Martin. So this is number two, maybe, and Karen, uh, the Babysitter's Club's Little Sisters, which follows Karen, and it's Christy's stepsister. If you know anything about the Babysitter's Club, um, you'll know who Karen is. So Karen is having a bad day. Like, she wakes up, things are just going wrong after wrong after wrong, and she's really struggling. And I really liked seeing this. Like, I gave it four and a half stars. I really liked seeing how she kept trying to turn it around and it just was not happening for her. It was a bad day. But things finally did turn around. And the only reason I it wasn't quite a five stars because, like, even the negatives, you I as an adult outside reader could see like the positives that came from the negatives and I wish they kind of would have discussed that but instead they did really talk about like resiliency and turning it around when you're having a bad day and so I I really enjoyed it and so did my daughter um next is the other people by CJ Tudor you guys I had not yet read a CJ Tudor book I got this one like our books our half price books had all of them like all of her books for three dollars and so I bought this one because this is the one I've heard the most about and I've heard I thought good things, but I just was not about it. So this is about a man who is driving home one night and he sees who he believes is his daughter in the back of a car saying like, daddy, help, whatever. He's She's clearly getting kidnapped. So he's stuck in this traffic jam and then all of a sudden I guess starts like this high speed chase to try to find her and then the car is found later and the daughter is presumed dead. He does not believe that. So he spends years and years and years going up and down this highway trying to find his daughter, which doesn't really make sense because if she was kidnapped, I highly doubt the person would be like driving where they kidnapped her, but whatever. Then there's also this network of like the other people who 
are not a revenge network. They say they're not a revenge network, but they basically are. There are people who no loss, no pain, no hurt. They like they have experienced all of that, and so they are basically wanting revenge on people who um, who have wronged them. And I just did not like. There's also a story of a woman and her daughter who know what happened to his daughter, and it's just boring like no, so much didn't make sense like the whole traffic jam and then high speed car race and then like being in the exact same spot and there's so many things that just like did not make sense that were stupid that it was like okay can this be over so i give that two stars next is angry housewives eating bonbons by uh lorna landvik and i gave this one three stars so this one is like my original bread and butter. So this is about five women who form a book club and it's just their lives and it spans 30 years of their lives. So you get to see them becoming mothers and then now grandmothers and all of that kind of stuff. But I thought this was just too broad. It really could have used honing in. So either less women, less time, something because it ended up being just so much that like there are big things that happen like marriages end, babies are born, um, big, big, big things happen and you're like, wait, it's om-, like, it's like a sentence in the book. It just is kind of quickly moved on and we're not given enough time. And so I really, I also feel like maybe three women, maybe four is like the best in these kind of stories. And so five was too much, especially given that it went through 30 years. So, um, three stars on that. Then I read The Cat's Meow by Herman Parrish. So this is number one or two, I think number two, in Amelia Bedelia and Friends. And so if you have not read um, Amelia Bedelia, it's the original series about this quirky little girl who takes everything very literally. And she's hilarious. It's a classic like middle grade series. Well, they have Amelia Bedelia and Friends now that is about her and her friend group. And this one, they're at school and a cat, it goes up in the tree. They try all these different ways to figure out how to get the cat down. And then they're trying to find a cat at home. And it's so sweet. It was really a fun read. Um, I gave that, let me see, I'm looking at my spreadsheet. I gave that four stars. So it was good. Um, Amelia Bedelia and her literalness, it leads for a lot of conversation starters as like the cat's meow and the cat's pajamas and all these like funny sayings that we use at least here in America and for my daughter she's still only four and so like even with conversation some of those are above her head so there's a lot of like stopping and starting when we read those but she still loves them. Next is Handle with Care by Jody Pico. So I gave this on four stars. This is about a family in which their daughter, it, it, in utero, they know that she has got something called, called osteogenesis imperfecta. So basically it's a collagen disorder where she it has very, very brittle bones that are gonna break very easily. And when she's born, she has like nine fractures or something. And they have to like put her basically in this like bubble wrap to give her to her mom when she's born. and. There's a lot of struggles that go along with that. Well, her best friend, the mother's best friend, was her OB. And now that Willow is the little girl, she is uh, six or seven or something. And a lawyer, they go to Disneyland or Disney World or something. And she falls on a like napkin, breaks a bunch of bones. And then they had not traveled with the piece of paper that said like she has this disease. And so then social services get involved because they see that she's had like tons and tons and tons of broken bones. And so, of course, the police in Florida are just doing their job trying to like protect this little girl from what's potentially a harmful situation. But the parents get really up in arms about it. And understandably, like both of those situations make sense. Um, So they try to sue and the lawyer's like, well, you don't have a suit there because they were just trying to do their job. But you may have a suit for wrongful birth which basically is saying go back and sue the OB saying that they should have told you sooner because she didn't find out until like 27 weeks that the baby had this disorder. And so the argument is that if she would have found out sooner, she would have had the um, choice to abort the child or not. And so it's a court case between a woman and her best friend who is her OB um, about wrongful birth. And that's really hard. That's really heavy. That's really like, um, there's a lot of discussion on ableism and the way disabled people are treated in our society and what constitutes uh, a life worth living. And I really enjoyed that conversation. 
Um, I had a strong opinion on the way the court case would, should go, which is not the way it usually goes for me with Jody Pico. Normally, I'm like, I don't know. I could see both sides of this. And I definitely um, had an opinion one way or the other in this court case. But it was still really interesting. And again, as Jody always does, like I had never heard of this osteogenesis imperfecta and I'm a science body nerd. And so I really found down, fell down a rabbit hole of learning more about it. And I love that she brought like something that I didn't know about to light. And so I gave it four stars. Next is Dragons and Marshmallows um, by Asia Citro. So this is the first in the Zoe and Sassafras series. And we have read a lot of Zoe and Sassafras. You've probably heard me talk about it. I ended up buying the first six in a box set for my daughter because she loves them so much. And we had not read number one or two. And so we read number one. It's about this. Well, we find out like the whole basis of the um, series is that there's this little girl named Zoe and her and her mom can see magical animals. So they have a barn and a magical animal will come knock on the barn door when they need help. So Zoe's mom is going out of town and Zoe just found out that she's got this ability. And so Zoe's mom's going out of town. So Zoe is responsible if anybody knocks on the bar barn door. And of course, a little baby dragon does and he needs help. And so Zoe tries to figure out like, what do I feed a dragon? What could be wrong? And there's so many different things that are really fun. And I love this series for like talking about girls in STEM and the scientific process and just figuring things out. And I loved it. I gave it five stars. This was probably my favorite of the series so far. So I don't think you need to read them in order, but I would definitely start there. Next is The Beach House by Jane Green. And I gave this one four stars. This is about a 60 something, I think, woman who lives in this beach house on Nantucket. She is a single woman. She's a widow. Um, she's got a grown son and she lives there and then finds out like all of the money that her husband had invested in different stocks and things have crashed. And so now she has no money. And so she either has to sell her house or figure out a way to make some money. And so she um, decides to start renting out rooms of her house. Now, that's like what the back in the synopsis says, and that is what the story is about. However, we get, I think there's three or four people who end up staying in the house, and we get, for the first like half of the book, is just following all their different stories, and then they come to the house, and like you don't, there's no like roommate, like housemate hijinks or anything like that. It's all just continuing to follow their stories in the backdrop of the fact that they're all in the same location. So, I really liked it because I really like Jane Green. Um, I would say this is women's fiction. There's definitely romance involved, but I would say it's more women's fiction and like people trying to find their path in life. And so I really enjoyed it. Gave it four stars. Next is Heartstopper Volume 2. You guys probably have heard me gush about Heartstopper Volume 1. Volume 2 came in and I loved it. I gave it four stars. This is a continuation of Nick and Charlie's story and they are a couple. Um, they are trying to figure out like... Nick is openly gay, or Charlie is openly gay, Nick is not, um, and so they're trying to, like, navigate that, and Char or Nick is really trying to figure out, like, who he is, um, what his sexuality is, this is all new to him, trying to navigate, like, uncharted ground for him, and so I really enjoyed it. It definitely brought me back to, like, my first love, being a teenager, experience all, experiencing all of that, and it felt so authentic, which I feel like is really hard to do, so I gave that five stars. Next is Someone We Know by Sherry Lapina. So I gave this one four stars. This one, again, is one that I had heard was about this neighborhood in which this teenage boy is going into different houses and breaking in and like hacking their computers. That is what this is about. However, it's more so about one of the neighbors is dead. She's found dead in the trunk of a car in the river, in the bottom of a river or whatever. And it's trying to figure out what happened to her. Her husband had reported her missing and the cops just brushed him off and were like, whatever. And then they found her body and they're like, okay, this was definitely murder. We need to figure this out. And so it's figuring out all the different neighborhood dynamics and everybody kind of seems a little sketchy and you never know what's going on. And I liked it. I really like, I don't, I feel like my expectations of the book going in were a little bit different than what it was, which did not bother me. That could have been my own, like my own fault. Um, there were a few things I didn't love, but overall I gave it four stars. I'm a big fan of Cherry LaPena and this one did not disappoint. And then last was Gentle and Lowly by Dane uh, or Ortland, maybe? 
Um, I'll put a picture up. But this, Chris Steph from Books and Jams did a month-long read-along on her channel where every Sunday, I think, she had a live show um, doing... Uh, uh, talking about a handful of chapters in this book. And I was not able to attend those live shows because it was just not at a time that works for our family. But it got me thinking about this book. And it is all about the heart of Christ and just how um, he is gentle and lowly. That's how he des Jesus describes his own heart and how he's compassionate and how he is just so kind and loving towards us even when we don't deserve it and how he's just always there. This book, in the beginning, it says it's for the broken, for the people who feel unworthy, for the people who feel just like they're not enough or, you know, something is wrong with them or whatever. And I think that's true, but I really think this is for everybody just to remember like the heart of God and what he does for us and what it means for us. And um, that we have like a loving father that is here with us and how awesome that is. And I listened to this all in one day on audio and I recommend doing it that way for one purpose. So I think this book is best to read physically and slowly and ideally with a group. Like I'm really upset that I did not read with the group. Um, and I am going to go back and watch those live shows because I think it's really like, I feel like that would be a way to get a lot out of it. However, listening to it on audio was also a really like life-giving experience because it was just somebody speaking truth over me throughout the whole day. Like somebody remind, reminding me of all the wonderful things about our God and just kind of speaking those truths and words of comfort over me. And so I, I bought a copy of the book so I can go through it again more slowly and like actually study what he's saying because it's heavy and dense and there's a lot of like stuff to unpack in there about um, really the implications of our God being the God he is for us. Um, so I want to go back through it, but I also think listening to it on audio is really good. And I could see this being one similar to Anxious for Nothing um, by Max Licato that I listen to maybe once a year, once every six months, like just whenever I'm feeling like I really need to, I feel like this could be one to keep in my back pocket to listen to or read repeatedly. So five stars on that if you if I didn't already say. So that was my first half of July, you guys. I feel like I had so much to say because there's so many good ones. Some months I get on here and it's like boom, boom, boom because I either don't remember that much or I don't want to say like a bunch of negative things. Um, but this month was so far so good. So high hopes for the second half of July. Um, it's the 17th as I'm filming this. So I got nothing but time, you guys. Let me know if you have read any of these books and what you thought and let me know what's the best thing you have read in July. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.